everyone. Welcome back to um, ADEX Pixel Expo and also to the one day digital launch of British High Commissioners Malaysian Nature Tours. Here with uh, we, the session that we will be discussing about right now would be on blue carbon rising, revitalizing conservation and management of coastal wetlands and seascapes for climate and nature resilience. The moderator for this session is none other than Dr. Hari Ramalu, Chairman of NSEARCH and Director of Akar Asia Consult. Here with, without any further ado, let me just pass over the baton to Dr. Hari. Dr. Hari, over to you. Thank you, Nora. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the British High Commission for organizing this session um, under your um, Malaysian Nature Tours. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be the moderator for this session. Um, I'm very honored to be with this list of uh, very distinguished panelists today, this afternoon, to um, uh, to discuss and and, and uh, you know be informed of the latest in regards to uh, a very pertinent topic uh, that fits well into the um, overall uh, Malaysian Nature Tour that is being organised by the British High Commission. Uh, my name is uh, Hari Ramalu Raghavan. Uh, I'm the moderator for your session uh, this afternoon. Um, I've been working in the environmental and management field in Malaysia and Asia Pacific for the past uh, 25 years. I've worked as a program manager with UNDP for 13 years. And prior to that, uh, I worked in a number of NGOs in Malaysia and elsewhere. Uh, I also had the opportunity to learn and work in Sweden and UK. Uh, this is the uh, brief, uh, uh, deep dive to uh, the um, part of the digital launch of British High Commissioner's Malaysian Nature Tour uh, in conjunction with 2021 Super Year for Biodiversity and Climate Change, and that is COP15 and COP26. Uh, the topic for this afternoon is Blue Carbon Rising, Revitalizing Conservation and Management of Coastal Wetlands and seascapes for climate and nature resilience. Uh, coastal oceans, coastal and oceans are some of the most uh, productive uh, ecosystems uh, on the planet, providing rich array of ecosystem services that maintain human survival and quality of life, supporting local communities and national economies. Uh, more than half of the world's population lives uh, within 200 kilometer uh, of the uh, a coast drawn to environmental and economic resources. Consequ uh, sorry, uh, uh, consequently, coastal ecosystems are among uh, the most threatened uh, under pressure from destructions and degradations. Uh, since the turn of the 19th century, it is estimated that 50% of all mangroves and tidal marshes and the seascapes ecosystems converted uh, into land use and for other purposes. The loss of these uh, ecosystems has resulted in the forfeiture of beneficial uh, ecosystem services they provide, including food provisions, uh, storm protections, climate regulations, and local ocean acidification buffering, uh, as well as aesthetic and spiritual beliefs. Now, one of the key services provided by the, these uh, ecosystems uh, that is historically overlooked is the regulations on the uh, global climate by uh, coastal and seascape ecosystems. The concepts of uh, coastal uh, blue carbon has emerged to recognize the need for improved management of coastal ecosystems to support these important climate regulating services. Uh, within just a few years, coastal blue carbon has evolved from a mostly scientific interest into a cross-cutting policy tool linking greenhouse gases accounting for uh, coastal and sea state environment, a major global emission source with short and long-term commitments to a wide range of countries, climate finance, both mitigation adaptation and funding opportunities for developed countries, private investors and coastal communities. Now, this is the sort of narration that we want to see uh, this afternoon and to talk uh, more about uh, the importance of uh, blue carbon of both coastal wetlands and seascapes. We have a very distinguished panelist this afternoon. Uh, let me introduce our, our, our panelists. 
Uh, I'm very pleased to be joined today with uh, these uh, expert panel who work or have an interest in Malaysian marine uh, ecosystems. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Julian Hyde, the Managing Director of ReefCheck Malaysia. We have uh, Dr. Amy Tan, Senior Lecturer, Ecology Biodiversity Program, University of Malaya. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Aldri Amir, Head, Environmental, Economic, Social Sustainability Research Center, Lestari, UKM. We have uh, Dr. McLaren Lakim, Director of Sabah Parks. We have uh, Dave McCann, Environmental Manager, Scuba Junkie, Marine Biologist, and Honorary Wildlife Warden. Uh, the narrative that I mentioned earlier will shortly be presented by this distinguished panel. Now, the panelists are, are all experts in their field, and uh, they are, of course, um, uh, um, you know, they can give their, their, their opinion uh, in regards to uh, climate and marine biodiversity uh, that involves these ecosystems. The panelists are free to express their views as an individual as well as the agency perspective. Uh, without further ado, I would like to invite, our, uh, sorry, the, each panelist will have 10 minutes to uh, present their, their, their topic. And then uh, once all the panelists have completed their presentations, we will have a, a question and answer session. So we will finish with the panelists first before we have a Q&A session. So without further ado, uh, I would like to invite our first speaker, uh, Julian Hyde, Managing Director, Reef Check Malaysia. Uh, he will talk a little bit on the um, Status of, uh, sorry, the status of um, uh, uh, Malaysian uh, coral reefs. Uh, uh, are we seeing climate impacts? Now, Julian is not very. Uh, 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 sorry, uh, Julian is, uh, is is a very uh, familiar with uh, in the, in the in the in the marine uh, 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 ecosystem uh, uh, field. Uh, he is the managing director of ReefCheck Malaysia, um, has been um, in Malaysia since uh, 1998. Um, uh, currently, he is uh, heading the ReefCheck, uh, uh, which has got a national coral reef survey program and field offices in three sites in Malaysia. And this was set up in 2007. Julian, can I invite you, please? Thank you, Harry. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, let me see if I can make this technology work. Uh, yeah, you have to share that. I'm hoping everybody can see this. Yeah, nice, lovely. So I was asked to speak about uh, the status of coral reefs in Malaysia. Um, you can't talk about the status of them without talking about what some of the impacts and the challenges are. Uh, it's a very short presentation. I will try not to bore everybody. In case anybody doesn't know, that's what a coral reef is. That's what we're talking about. Uh, clear water, lots of color, lots of fish, lots of life, lots of value. Um, the, um, the value of coral reefs, why are we interested? Uh, there are some obvious benefits to society, such as uh, it's a food source and it provides employment and tourism. Uh, ecologically, it's home to a third of fish species. Uh, it's a nursery ground for a quarter of marine species. Um, and what's behind those data is that if the reefs are not there, then a lot of marine creatures start to develop and a lot of communities rely on those marine creatures for, for either food or uh, jobs in fisheries. Um, in addition to this, a, a, a lesser known fact about coral reefs is that they actually protect about 20% of the world's coastlines from erosion. Uh, the island that I used to live on, Pulau Tiaman, uh, as a good example, uh, the government had to spend 40 million uh, uh, a concrete seawall because erosion was starting to sort of cut away slowly at the island and that was in part due to the fact that coral reefs in that area had been slowly degraded over the years. So there's a direct con con uh, connection between the, um, the actual presence of that coral reefs and what is happening on the island. Uh, I have a thunderstorm just arrived outside my window so I hope this is going to go okay. Okay, so variety of reasons that reefs are important. What's happening? This is our 2019 
survey data summary. Um, and this is, is, is a quick snapshot. Uh, what it's basically saying is that these two columns, the first two columns here, just over 40% 40, 40 of live coral cover, hard coral cover and soft coral cover, which is considered to be a reasonable status of the reefs. Uh, the indicators that we are concerned about are things like algae and uh, rubble, uh, as well as recently killed coral, which together show you how much uh, recent disturbance there has been, either from boat damage or from sewage pollution, maybe from uh, coral bleaching, a, a climate change related event. So those are the sorts of negative indicators that we compare here with. But the snapshot only gives us a very, it only gives us part of the picture. What we really need to do is look at the data over a number of years, and this is going back to 2007. And there's three important parts to this graph. This is the early years. Now, the number of sites we had was a bit variable, so the data was a bit up and down, but an extrapolation shows us that the health of the reefs in those three, four years was, was pretty uh, stable. Then we had the coral bleaching event. There you go, there's a climate change related event in 2010, which caused a drop from uh, nearly 55, nearly 50% down to uh, about 45% in, in live coral cover. So five percentage points, a 10% reduction in live coral cover just in over one year. We then saw a period of recovery over the next four or five years. In fact, they were healthier afterwards than they were before, which shows us that the reefs have got some natural resilience, which is a good thing. Unfortunately, since then, it's all been downhill. And in the last four or five years, we've seen a reduction now from over 50%, almost reaching 60% actually, down to less than 50% live coral cover. So again, a 10% reduction in uh, coral cover. That is troubling. And it's this area that we need to concentrate on. This is caused by a mixture of what we call local and global threats. Uh, the global threats are global warming. This is the, uh, the temperature, sea surface temperature data that's available from NOAA. Uh, which we monitor every week. This shows us how the sea surface temperature is changing and where there might be bleaching. We've got ocean acidification as more and more CO2 uh, uh, dissolves into the ocean. The ocean acidifies and those creatures which create shells, i.e. all of the shellfish that we like to eat, are going to start suffering because the shells will no longer form and organisms will, will disappear, they'll die. We've also got increasing storms. Uh, earlier this year, we had Storm Pabble in Tranganu, which caused massive damage to the shallow reefs in Tranganu. Uh, there was 25, 30, 40 percent even reduction in hard coral cover in some of the reefs which got dashed by the storms in shallow water. There's not a lot that we can do about this on a local level. When I mean me, I mean me, my team, I mean the people we work with in the field. We cannot individually do anything about carbon dioxide levels if we believe that carbon dioxide causes global warming and climate change. This is a government to government initiative. This is what the COPs are about. This is what the global treat is about. All we can do is advocate to do as much as possible. What we can do is build uh, resilience at the local level by managing local threats. Fish bombing is common in Sabah still. It does huge damage to the ecosystems. Overfishing can destabilize ecosystems. Unregulated, unmanaged tourism can do huge amounts of damage. I'm sure that anybody that's dived on the islands off the East Coast has mm -hmm. seen similar scenes to this with, with just people just being crazy uh, about what they're doing. And siltation from, from development. Uh, again, the island I used to live on, Tim, and survived many years with no tourism development, with, with no new resorts, but there's increasing pressure now on the island. There are several new resorts built recently. How far do we want to let that go? What are we going to do in terms of controlling tourism so that these ecosystems can be managed and can be conserved effectively? So overall, I would say climate change, bad for coral reefs, bad for people. Um, uh, but we are seeing a lot of climate change impacts. Um, now, um, uh, I hope you can still see my screen here because I've just switched some other notes on. Um, we look at, uh, we look at um, climate changes as kind of a peripheral issue on coral reefs because there doesn't really seem to be much we can do about it. But in reality, if we don't start to look at things from a different perspective and start really doing things differently, we are going to no longer than play around the margins of conserving coral reefs in the long term. 
These are the four areas that we think are necessary, local are necessary to look at local communities, stakeholder participation, management and legislation. For local communities, resilience is not about bio biology, biological resilience. It's about economic resilience and social resilience. Uh, look at what happens when COVID brought an end to tourism. Most of the people on the islands were out of work. What are they going to do? They're going to go back to their traditional pastimes of fishing. Uh, and they're all fishing in marine parks. So we're back to damaging marine ecosystems. How are we going to help those communities to develop alternative livelihoods? How are we going to look at our national tourism strategy? We have got to move away from this concept of mass tourism being the only way we can attract visitors. We've got to look at smaller niche, high value ecotourism because our international competitors, the Indonesian and Philippines are doing this. And if we don't, we will lose out in that market. Stakeholder part participation. Um, we strongly believe that empowering people is better than commanding them. Uh, we need to improve, we would advocate for better policies on co-management. And again, our case study in Tierman, where we've established a community group to look at community issues, to look at community participation, is showing some signs of success with new programs emerging from the ones that we've set up. In terms of management, do we actually have sufficient capacity and skills to manage marine parks effectively? We would like to propose establishing a dedicated marine research management qualification training program. We don't actually have marine park managers uh, in, in Malaysia. We have fisheries officers, but there's no specifically trained, nobody's got a, a master's degree or a, bio, a, a bachelor's degree in marine resource management, in, in, in the management side of things. And finally, looking at legislation and policy, it seems to us that marine resource management is a pretty low priority. Uh, we are advocating for a comprehensive oceans policy and stronger legislation to protect marine resources. If we do all of this and we do it well, we will help to reduce local impacts. We will help to build the resilience of these important ecosystems and we will help to protect the risk for climate change, which creates build, builds long term resilience for the communities and the ecosystems. I'll leave it there and I'd be happy to answer questions later on if anybody has them. Harry, back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian. We, um, our next uh, speaker um, is uh, uh, Dr. Amy. Uh, Dr. Amy is from University of Malaya and uh, she is uh, doing a research project um, on interdisciplinary in nature uh, and related to marine fisheries and mangroves. Uh, her mangrove work include uh, food web studies, mangrove restoration, social ecological dimensions, of mangrove-based fisheries, uh, ecosystem services assessment, and mangrove-related policy initiative. Um, she also applies multiple approach in assessment of local um, Elasmo branch fisheries, marine megafauna bycatch, and impacts of marine parks gazettement on mm -hmm. fishery and local community livelihood. So please, Amy. Um, kindly present your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hari, for the uh, kind introduction. Just uh, checking that everyone can see my slides and hear me clearly. Yes. Wonderful, thank you. Yes. I've been thank having you. a little bit of a technological problem, so uh, it's uh, good to know that uh, the slides are working. So firstly, um, I want to thank the British High Commission for giving opportunity for me to share some of the work that my UK and Malaysian collaborators have done um, in the Klang Island mangroves, as well as the local communities there. So as Julian um, highlighted, right, for the coral reefs, you can't separate discussions, you know, on the um, resilience of the ecosystems without talking about the local communities. So I'm very excited to share, you know, some of the work that we have done um, in a very localized area here um, in, in, in the heart of the Klang Valley area. So I want to acknowledge uh, my UK collaborators uh, for this work, um, University of Plymouth, as well as uh, Plymouth uh, Marine Laboratory, as well as our funders, uh, the UKRI, as well as the Newton Unku Omar Fund uh, for trusting us, you know, to uh, conduct this research. So I thought that um, we could start firstly, you know, by asking a very simple question. Um, what is a resilient 
healthy ecosystem. So uh, you can see a picture of uh, the mangroves in the background. And I think, you know, um, for different people, uh, resilient, healthy ecosystem mean different things. But we probably all can agree that um, this would include clean air, unpolluted water that is free from rubbish, and healthy growing trees in abundance. So I'm going to introduce um, a, a term, which is, it sounds very business-like, and that's because uh, most of the um, use of this term, you know, has been associated with um, businesses and private sector. But the term natural capital, okay, is basically um, uh, talking about the natural assets that all of us um, benefit from our forests, our soil, our clean air, water, and all living things. So all of us as human beings, we depend on and derive from these natural capital a wide range of goods and services, and they are very vital, therefore, you know, um, for them to be resilient. So mangrove forests, and I understand that we have uh, probably some uh, international people um, on this uh, platform right now. So uh, they are known locally as hutan paya bakau. So mangrove forests are probably the most uh, prominent natural capital lining the coastal areas of most of the coastline of Malaysia, including Selangor. Hopefully you can see the Selangor flag uh, over here. So you can also see uh, in the picture on the left, uh, which is a, a very nice picture taken from a recent book that was uh, published on the status of a mangroves uh, in Malaysia, showing sort of like, you know, the coexistence between uh, our mangroves as well as the increasingly urbanized coastal areas um, of our country. And um, <clears throat> This ecosystem, you know, is very much um, linked uh, to um, uh, and, and uh, being called as home to a lot of a uh, wide variety of very important uh, ecological um, vegetation. So you can see a, a number of examples here. Also, mangroves are home to a wide range of um, animals, and I cannot do justice to all of them, you know, uh, in a single slide, but you have a uh, diversity of mammals, birds, reptiles. And some of these you recognize as your food source, the things that you eat um, and enjoy, you know, uh, for, for your seafood pleasure. So these are um, the kind of uh, important services that mangroves uh, provide for us. So when we uh, spoke to the local communities, you know, um, there is no wonder um, they are able to point out, you know, the numerous ways in which uh, mangroves um, are, are very important. Right? So if you look at the table here to the left, um, uh, local communities are able to identify it, um, the obvious things, you know, for exam example, the provision of timber, uh, fisheries resources, medicine sources, and it's also linked to their um, cultural heritage. So most of us might be familiar with the Mahmeri group, um, the mask wearing um, culture. And this is a, a, an important um, group of people that rely on mangroves for their cultural heritage, as well as their health and well-being. So um, in talking about um, Klang Valley, right, um, this is sort of like, you know, where the hub of uh, the state of Selangor is. Um, most of us, uh, I, I was a little bit staggered uh, when I checked up the statistics, and I hope I'm correct. But what I found was that, you know, 25% uh, of Malaysia's total population occupy the Klang Valley, which is actually an area of just less than 3% of our country's total land mass. So that's a lot of uh, people uh, living in a, in a single area. And I think that, you know, uh, most of us are very familiar with the uh, picture, the images that is uh, being shown here, right? In the past few months, you know, due to, um, well, the pandemic, as well as, you know, the uh, pollution events that we've had, uh, we've had, you know, uh, numerous uh, water cut supplies over the past few months. And this um, sort of, you know, gave us an opportunity to consider how important um, clean rivers are. 
Now, mangroves, um, on the other hand, are also, um, look, uh, if you think about the mangroves here, um, circled in red, these are located downstream um, of the Klang Valley. And they are really, um, uh, in addition to serving as, you know, our coast inland, they are also important uh, natural coastal defenses particularly prominent uh, during the tsunami event um, that happened some years back. And also, they serve as our coastal kidneys. And why do I call kidney? Well, because the mangroves are known to be very important um, coastal filters that um, filter all of the human and industrial activities taking place upstream. My apologies, I was warned that um, my Wi-Fi is not stable, so I'm turning off my video right now. So a little bit more about Klang Island's uh, mangroves. So this is an area that comprises eight major mangrove islands uh, known locally as Pulau. We have three inhabited islands, which are Pulau Keri, Pulau Inda, and Pulau Ketam. And the other five uninhabited islands have been gazetted as the Klang Islands Mangrove Forest Reserve since 1904. And actually Pulau Ketam, which most of us uh, know to be associated with fresh seafood and tourism supply, also been gazetted recently. However, since um, 1988, approximately 60% of mangroves in Pulau Keri and 70% of mangroves in Pulau Inda have been lost due to demands for multiple land use changes. To put it a little bit in context, mangroves lost in this area is equivalent to 8,300 football field areas or another way of um, uh, uh, talking about this from a carbon standpoint is that this is equivalent to an estimated carbon emissions from almost 650,000 cars per year. So that's really um, quite, quite a lot. Local livelihoods in this area have traditionally been fisheries linked. And our research group, um, for short, we call them Netcom Fish, wanted to look at how these communities can be empowered to manage their mangrove and fisheries resources. So for two years, from 2017, we conducted a series of workshops, focus group discussions, interviews, and visioning exercises with local communities and other key stakeholders to understand the mangrove users, uses, and linkages in the past and present, and what does the future hold for mangroves in the Klang Islands. So what do these mangrove losses mean? Well, from the local community standpoint, they were able to pinpoint very specifically the effects of these losses on various aspects of their lives and well-being, as well as that of their um, next generation. And uh, I, I uh, put up here some quotes, uh, paraphrased, uh, but this reflected you know, uh, the views of the people that we spoke to. So they also acknowledge that while the development of the area is necessary, but along with the mangrove losses are a host of um, numerous hardships, uh, warmer temperatures, loss of storm protection, increased erosion, and perhaps a little bit surprising um, for me personally anyway, is that you know, they don't see a future uh, for local fisheries. Even in Pulau Ketam, you know, they don't see um, fisheries or seafood uh, playing an important role in the future. And that's kind of scary. So today, in various parts of Selangor and Malaysia, we continue to lose mangroves and their ecosystem services despite their importance. So our project conducted a stakeholder analysis looking at mapping um, interest uh, versus um, influence that different stakeholders have. And we find that parties with strong interest in mangroves and their protection are often those with limited influence. While stakeholders um, that are circled in red for example, um, state entities, property developers, and other businesses may not recognize the immense impact that they can have on mangroves. So really, we find that, you know, from a focus on community, the future of mangroves in Klang Islands and extending this to other urbanized coastal areas in Malaysia requires engagement and commitment of multiple stakeholders, especially businesses and the private sector. So as part of our research um, output, our NetConfish group produced a policy brief 
and I won't bore you in too much details, but in this document, we outline the importance of mangroves, the issues that are faced, and we also highlighted six recommendations that we can collectively take to arrest further losses of mangroves and to ensure a future for this natural capital. So um, it is a little bit wordy, but I wanted to highlight that we recognize the importance of state and local governments, as well as the private sector initiative uh, and their ability to take actions for sustainable development that is inclusive of mangroves. So in the next phase of our journey in building mangrove resilience, our team uh, called NEXEMS, which is short for Nexus Action for Mangroves in Selangor, will focus on a series of activities that aim to catalyze changes in national and state policies relevant to mangroves, as well as co-formulating local strategies that different groups can take, including businesses. I am very excited to see that multinational and local businesses are increasingly committed to maintain resilience of our natural capital. So here is a plug uh, for the session that will happen on the same platform later this afternoon. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected all of us in multiple ways and the recognition of resilient ecosystems cannot come at a time now. Um, I would like to thank everyone for this time and I hope that you know, especially for those of us in the Klang Valley, please stand up and speak up for your green lungs and your green kidneys. So please reach out to us as well. I have placed my contact there and thank you everyone for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you very much. Uh, we, like I said, we can have questions uh, for Amy uh, after all the presentation has completed the presentations. Uh, our next presenter is uh, Dr. Aldri Amir. Uh, he is a mangrove ecologist by training and a senior lecturer, research fellow at the um, Lestari of UKM. Uh, currently, he heads the um, en Environmental, Economic and Social Sustainability Research Center uh, at Lestari UKM. Uh, he's also um, a commission member of the IUCN, uh, SSC Mangrove Specialist Group, and coordinator of the Malaysian Mangrove Research Alliance and Network. Uh, to you, Dr. Aldrich, please. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Hari, for the kind introduction, and thank you, uh, British High Commission, uh, for the invite and for organizing this. It's really appreciated. Glad to be here on the same platform with, with so many friends. And thanks for the kind introduction on, on, on uh, the background of mangroves, uh, Amy, and, and also. Uh, sorry. You can see my screen, right? All right, so, okay. So ladies and gentlemen, um, the grand challenge um, we are facing today is very real and they are coming our way, affecting each one of us in all parts of the planet. And this is not fantasy, no, no, no fiction. What we are facing today is a big, huge, monstrous nemesis in the form of human-induced climate catastrophe uh, that brings with it extreme changes and disturbances at the planetary scale. So to combat this, we really need to strategize. Science has proven that the pumping of carbon to the atmosphere induced by us humans for many generations and millennia uh, had contributed to the increase in atmospheric temperature. And that had triggered glaciers melting, oceans heating up, sea levels rising, and so on and so forth. And yes, we need a powerful weapon to combat this. Nature have gifted us with plants, green plants that carry out photosynthesis, which is the oldest, greenest, most sophisticated technology to fix carbon that we release and produce. And of all the green plants and habitats we have on Earth, there exists a global powerhouse of carbon sequester and carbon store that not only extremely efficient at doing that, 
but also to provide uh, a multitude and range of ecosystem services to the global communities. So mangroves, sea grasses, and salt marshes are our superpower weapon. These three major coastal habitats and ecosystems, collectively known as the blue carbon ecosystem, faster and to store more carbon in their bodies, their above ground biomass, as well as in their roots, and more importantly, in the soil underneath them. But do take note, blue carbon ecosystems are not just about the plants, eh, the trees or the greeneries. The whole biodiversity from microbial organisms to the largest mammals play important roles eh, to sustain the ecosystem. I have a secret to tell you. You can tell your friends and families. So mangrove trees, eh, they absorb carbon dioxide to make food for themselves, to grow and to stay healthy. And like every living thing, they grow old gracefully. So along the way, their leaves turn yellow and brown and fall off. So crabs, among, among others, will grab and eat them. And they drag these leaves into their burrows and patch them onto the walls of their burrows. Decomposed they by bacteria and the tritivores, yeah, all the carbon from these leaves yeah, and other organic materials Teamwork, this collaboration among the organisms contributes to making these habitats the most prolific carbon sequester and carbon storage in the world. And mangroves are important nurseries and habitats for fish, marine life and wildlife. And for the longest of time, humans have benefited from mangroves yeah, for protection, for sustenance and livelihoods. So the dependency on these resources were the primary reasons yeah, for the establishment and development of many civilizations in the world. So if you look closely on this map, these civilizations across the tropics are located on the coasts at the mouth of major river systems. And the trend is exactly similar to the current modern state of Malaysia. Yeah, coastal villages grow to, to become a town, cities, and eventually a mega city, all with the benefits derived from the surrounding resources. But now, the demands, eh, uh, the needs, and all of these challenge the survival and the integrity of our mangroves and coastal resources. And particularly important for us in ASEAN, all the countries combined, we collectively have the highest number, highest abundance, and the extent of mangroves and blue carbon compared to other regions throughout the equator. But remarkably, <laughs> we are also yeah, the global hotspot of mangrove loss. Many of the nations, yeah, in, in fact, all of the countries are striving to develop. Uh, we are all striving to push for the social and the economic pillars at the expense of our environment, particularly our coastal ecosystem. And human impacts yeah, on, on mangroves are usually massive and permanent. And some human activities cause uh, chain reactions in which the impacts may be visible later on or indirectly, such as in the case of coastal erosion, yeah, subsidence, etc. So we exploit this fragile coastal lands and sustain be left abandoned after several years before other kind of developments or encroachments seep in instead of rehabilitating. And the demand on land for urban development is increasing. And it grows more and more rapidly. And by building buns or seawalls or, or other physical structures, we inhibit uh, natural dynamic processes from taking place and increase its vulnerability. Keep in mind that mangroves yeah, require buffer to play the buffering role yeah, to protect our coast and ourselves, the coastal communities. One significant impact that we cause due to patchy development and careless planning is fragmentation of mangrove forests. And fragmentation, uh, fragmentation yeah, is a major driver of ecosystem degradation. It reduces uh, the capacity of, of habitats uh, to provide many important services.
and many others. Yeah? Now, we must seriously reflect yeah, on and analyze on the intensity, the magnitude, and the scale of our actions and their impacts on our coastal habitats and ecosystems. We can see these yeah, happening and affecting humans more frequently now. So to re rectify our past mistakes, yeah, which now coincide with extreme weather events, we, we have to do our part uh, in conser conserving yeah, them uh, the right way, yeah, the right manner. Yeah. The best way is first to fully protect what we have left and disallow physical development and damaging encroachment on our natural ecosystems. We, we may also need uh, to evaluate our current management practices to ensure that our sustainability is future-proof. Yeah, this is important. Total protections of mangroves and seagrass beds in Malaysia could be pushed as a main conservation agenda. Disturbed or degraded habitats and work hand in hand with the authorities, with the public and private organizations, with the local communities and scientific communities to rehabilitate these sites. There are some good models and guidelines to be followed because we must remember that Ecosystem restoration is not a numbers game. It, it requires honest commitment from all of us. It requires us to strategize, to plan, yeah, to monitor, and to work collab collaboratively. Finally, it is utmost important for us to appreciate and recognize the value of the services provided by healthy functioning mangrove and blue carbon habitats and ecosystems yeah, that provide uh, all these services you regulate, host, and support wide range and multitude of ecosystem services. These are just some that I can throw in at the moment. And by understanding these, yeah, we will naturally develop solid conservation and regulations like payments for ecosystem services, carbon, cred carbon credit and financing, for example and the establishment of more protected areas for wise and sustainable use. Connectivity of these ecosystems, yeah, how they re interact, how they influence each other, all the processes involved must be properly understood to ensure solid management of our coastal resources. We cannot look at them in silos. We cannot tackle issues by just targeting one particular habitat because they are all in essence connected. Knowledge, understanding, perceptions on mangrove and blue carbon ecosystems are extremely important as they trigger yeah, wise or bad decisions on resource management and conservation. Huge amount of biodiversity depends on mangroves. Large population of humans across the globe rely on mangroves. Basically, the planet needs mangroves and relies on mangroves and their connecting systems. Yeah. much time huh? or to waste uh, on making bad and wrong decisions pertaining to our survival. It is our responsibility, yeah, the current generation, to ensure to collectively uphold the triple bottom lines of sustainability, which is the environment, our economy and our social well-being. It is not just the job and responsibility of ecologists, marine scientists or foresters. Yeah, blue carbon research and management and conservation involve and require expertise from across the disciplines. No one person or group can champion this alone. It must be tackled in a multi, inter and or transdisciplinary manner. So one of the key identified global missions that we have all agreed upon and we have to achieve is to reverse our negative contributions and slow down so together let's contribute significantly to the protection of these habitats yeah, brilliant habitats i would say and and blue carbon ecosystems for the benefits of our current and future generations thank you ladies and gentlemen for listening and for your time Thank you, Dr. Aldri. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, overarching kind of explanation on the old ecosystems.
and the relation to the uh, blue carbon. Um, our next speaker is uh, um, Cheryl Rita Kaur. She's from MIMA, the Marine uh, Maritime Institute of Malaysia. Uh, Rita is the head of the Center for Coastal and Marine Environment. Um, she is doing research, uh, a policy research institute set up by uh, MIMA, that is, uh, set up by Malaysian government to look into matters relating to Malaysia's interests at sea and serve as the national focal point for research in the maritime uh, sector. Uh, research interests um, are in the area of ocean governance, natural resources, marine protected areas, uh, management and uh, marine pollution. Uh, she has extensive uh, standing uh, uh, at the regional and national levels on environmental uh, policy matters. Uh, over to you, Rita. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hari, for the very kind uh, introduction. Uh, I believe my slides are already on screen now. Yes. Um, well, I would say uh, a lot has been covered by the previous uh, speakers, but I'm going to zoom in specifically on the policy aspects. Yes. Uh, and for those that are not very familiar with MIMA, we are actually a government uh, policy research institution, so the subject matter is going to be a bit more dry compared to the previous uh, speakers. It's not as colorful. Uh, but uh, please bear with me. I'd like to provide you with an overview, overarching uh, ideas in terms of what Malaysia uh, is looking at, uh, especially in terms of uh, policy, institutional framework, uh, legislation, and so on. So I'll be covering a little bit on managing coastal wetlands. What are some of the new narratives for climate action, specifically on blue carbon? Now, I believe uh, Dr. Adri has very... Uh, uh, nicely elaborated uh, on a blue carbon, what is uh, the understanding with blue carbon and what's exactly uh, we mean when we, we mention blue carbon. So it's pretty much uh, carbon uh, stored in coastal ecosystems like mangroves, seagrasses, and intertidal salt marshes. And the, the understanding uh, in general or layman's uh, term is that if you uh, cut off the mangrove or you degrade the coastal ecosystems, it's going to release the carbon that has been stored uh, in this ecosystem. So uh, that is uh, the basic understanding of blue carbon. But uh, having been working on coastal ecosystems uh, conservation and protection for a while now, I would believe that we've been talking about conservation before, but it's something that's, I call it more of a a catchy term that is used to specifically emphasize the importance of these coastal ecosystems in uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation uh, strategies. Now, why is it important? Uh, well, again, uh, the previous speaker has already mentioned this, uh, but uh, it is especially important in this region because of the huge or extensive coverage that we have of these coastal ecosystems that we are talking about. Uh, so blue carbon ecosystems are extensive and there is high sequestration rates that has been uh, uh, understood from this. In fact, uh, research shows that uh, blue carbon storage in uh, these ecosystems are way higher than the terrestrial uh, uh, forests and ecosystems. Hence, it is important. Now, linking it to the IPCC models, it actually shows that you know, the understanding the experts has actually mentioned that emission reduction and avoidance itself uh, alone is not adequate. There needs to be more emphasis on sequestrations. And hence, blue carbon uh, aspects has been uh, incorporated in some of the recent uh, discussions at the international and regional levels. For instance, it's been mentioned in the UN FCCC uh, convention is in the Paris Agreement it's increasingly being recognized through uh, countries reporting their NDCs, the national determined uh, contributions and so on. However, these ecosystems as also rightly uh, showed in some of the figures in the previous presentation, it, it shows that one of the greatest threats that we are facing is actually from coastal development. There are many other drivers and pressures on these ecosystems, but one of the main ones, including in Malaysia would be coastal development activities. Now, uh, this is just to show you on the extensive distribution of uh, these coastal ecosystems and just look at this region. It's pretty much centered here. And while the uh, negotiations and uh, consultations are going on around the world, I think it's uh, particularly important that we look into 
the conservation of coastal ecosystems, especially in this region, because we have the rich uh, resources right at our backyard. Now, um, it, in this short time that I have, it's, it's going to be impossible to share with you the uh, policy narratives that uh, has been ongoing the last several years. It's a very topical issue. Is something that uh, have attracted most of the experts, scientists, uh, policymakers, managers, in terms of uh, blue carbon, uh, from the understanding, from the methodology, uh, to the policy framework now. So you see a lot of reports that has been established over the years. And this is, uh, this is not a comprehensive list. This is just to provide you with a snapshot in one slide that so much is happening out there. And what is it that we are looking at uh, specifically in this region and specifically for Malaysia? So you see that, you know, uh, this is a range by years, but uh, I'm sure there are more recent uh, reports and publications as well. But I'm giving particular attention to the blue carbon policy framework here, not too much on the scientific and technical aspects. Now, moving into the international climate policy perspective, uh, the main ones that you cannot run away would be the international mechanism. We're talking about international mechanism, the sense of the UN FCCC convention, uh, and then uh, related or subsequent uh, developments from there. The Kyoto Protocol, post-Kyoto Protocol, and the more recent Paris Agreement. And if you try to zoom in into some of the policy provisions within these international frameworks, you will find very clear and distinct uh, focus in terms of, uh, in one way or another, uh, mentioning about uh, the need to conserve these ecosystems, the need to measure how much contribution of carbon sequestration is coming from these ecosystems. So if you can just zoom into the first line here, the UNFCCC provides provisions relating to sustainable management and conservation of coastal and marine ecosystems, as rightly pointed out also by Audrey earlier, uh, the SDGs. And then if you look into the Kyoto Protocol, there are specific provisions talking about land use and land use change, forestry, clean development uh, mechanism, CDM mechanism. And then if you go a little bit more uh, from there, you look at post-Kyoto protocols, uh, red plus is mentioned and so on, which uh, I, Malaysia is a member. So we have to look at it in, in that perspective. And then more, the more recent one, Paris Agreement, uh, and this is, is something that's uh, discussed uh, very much now. I believe Malaysia has not specifically uh, incorporated the blue carbon uh, information in there, but we're definitely looking uh, towards moving in that direction. And then there are specific articles within this agreement, which talks about uh, indirectly or directly related uh, requirements or specifications that would again bring back to a uh, blue carbon or coastal ecosystem protection. And the overall or the overarching uh, objective is really towards one objective. If you look at it, it's in, in general terms here, it's looking at stabilizing concentration of GHGs, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere at a level that will prevent dangerous uh, anthropogenic uh, interference in the climate system. So if you just look at this slide, it looks very simple. It looks like it's straightforward. But if you look, go into details, you'll find that there's a lot of uh, details within that you have to really dig out and then look at it in the, in the sense of what's happening at the national level, what's happening in our policies, and so on. Now, looking at all those overarching documents there are already, and then uh, what we we like to do further is to go uh, specifically on the uh, Blue Carbon Policy Assessment Framework. There's an IUCN guideline, I would say, that speaks about what should be some of the main areas that we should cover when we talk about policies? Uh, well, I can share here that MIMA has done at least some legwork on it. Some basic uh, uh, research has been done, but I believe there's still a lot more to cover uh, to make sure that we have a comprehensive assessment of uh, blue carbon, at least for Malaysia. So I would not uh, bore you with the details here, but it's all leads uh, down clearly in terms of what would be the steps or what would be the framework specification that would be uh, that you would have to cover if you talk about policy aspects in terms of addressing blue carbon ecosystems. Uh, now, of course, we usually say policy, but it, it, it comes with accompanied uh, needs in terms of legal provisions, market uh, features, institutional mechanisms and frameworks. You can call it at the different ministries, the council, task forces, whatever you may call it. But 
those are the things that you have to really go into detail in terms of the policy analysis. So I believe we are still at the very beginning stage. We have not really come to the uh, legal part or the market features specifically or the institutional mechanism more in a more defined way. It's still very much at the policy analysis, but there are plans to move towards uh, some of the students that has been mentioned on this slide. Now, very quickly, whenever I mention blue carbon, I, well, you might not agree with me, but coming from a policy angle, I believe blue carbon really reached its height of attention within the government through goal four of the Coral Triangle Initiative. That's how I look at it. Because in terms of scientific work, uh, it was always there. Researchers were working on it, you were uh, doing your groundwork, collecting data and so on. But in terms of policy, uh, the drive really came from uh, goal four. Uh, climate change in terms of uh, Coral Triangle Initiative's goals. There, we saw more defined uh, consultations and discussions between the government, uh, especially, where uh, I, I believe the ideas in terms of what needs to be done and sharing of experiences, expertise across the six countries took place. So uh, I like to mention here the more specific uh, outlines that we have was uh, from the CTI Blue Carbon Workshop in 2017 in, 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 in Philippines, where when we looked at what is happening at the national level for Malaysia, uh, the needs that was identified included the, the need for blue carbon profiling, the signs for blue carbon area distribution, what are the carbon stocks in, in that part, they were saying, like, you know, we need to identify how much do we have? We didn't have the baseline data. Uh, the need to co-engage government in terms of policy. People were saying that you know, a lot of work is being done on the ground, but then are we engaging the government in terms of policy? Uh, the need for in-house training on coastal ecosystems and uh, blue carbon was also identified as one of the needs at the national level because we saw a lot of uh, international expertise, a lot of international work, but what about national, regional? And uh, so forth from there, uh, more recently, just last uh, year in July, we had a follow-up. Uh, there were representatives from the government side, uh, from the focal uh, uh, point in, in UNISTI Malaysia Sabah and so on. And when we look at what was some of the developments since 2017, well, we came up with this list. And this list is specifically referring to what's happening in Malaysia uh, from the government uh, governance perspective. Um, we identified that over the last two years or so, uh, there has been uh, research established on the ground, especially by you know some of the agencies like Forestry, uh, FRIM, and so on, and some universities. There has been some pilot sites established. Uh, there has been an increase of number of researchers or participants from Malaysia in programs or activities related to blue carbon at the different platforms. So we believe that in by 2019, there was a bit more uh, understanding of the methodology and data compilation. It's not complete, but we, we better understand uh, the, the subject matter. There has been uh, good information and management measures on coastal ecosystems. You've seen also, you know, presentation of marine parks and so on. Uh, but like, like uh, mentioned, uh, there needs to be more details specifically on blue carbon, specifically on those areas that are not yet protected in terms of, you know, mangroves and seagrass is uh, a totally uh, different picture because you have to try to also come up with protection for uh, seagrasses. Uh, now, since then, we were planning to have a national forum specifically on blue carbon to look into gaps and challenges in terms of policy. Unfortunately, uh, COVID happened and this has been uh, delayed a little bit. We hope uh, maybe next year we can pick up again on this idea and uh, move forward from there. Uh, but there were also still constraint issues and challenges that we identified. And some of these are already listed. Uh, you, can, you can see lack of expertise still. We don't really have that many people working on this subject uh, at the national level. Uh, we need more trainings. Uh, and then uh, we need to look into government uh, uh, aspects in terms of you know, incorporating blue carbon especially into our NDCs and so on. So this is a snapshot. It's not the complete list, but this was some of the major points that came up in that uh, G2G uh, consultations then. Now, having said that, uh, well, MIMA itself in-house, we've also done some assessment on the policy aspects. And you'll see that I'm, I'm not sharing with you the full report here, but some of the ideas that came up from that study uh, funded by MIMA 
and uh, where we identified some of the broad range uh, areas that we need to further focus on. And some of these are highlighted in blue here. You know, what is the current uh, coastal carbon potentials uh, for Malaysia? What would be required to development for the development of uh, blue carbon action plans, for instance? What are the opportunities? What are the needs? What are the limits? Uh, where do we stand in terms of, uh, of our national data and inventories and so on? We need to incorporate coastal blue carbon into existing coastal conservation initiatives. We have been talking about coastal protection, coastal conservation, and so on. Um, well, but are we really talking about the carbon aspects of uh, these ecosystems? That is something to look further into. And this is more on the management aspects. What about the uh, policy measures and financial incentives. What are we planning to do on those aspects? So this is elaborated in that report. And at that point, we did mention that we need to look into priority areas and pilot projects. But I believe since then, there has been some pilot areas established in terms of uh, data collection, but this might still be just in you know ad hoc snapshot uh, loca localities. There might need to be more areas in terms of making comparisons and looking at the different pressures, drivers, uh, situation, status, and so on. Um, we can leverage on uh, what we are already doing in terms of goal four of the CDI on climate change, but we need to move also from there towards uh, maybe looking at it more specifically in terms of our national climate change policy, for instance, 2009. I think it, it needs to be reviewed already. So there are emerging areas that we need to incorporate into that policy. And yeah. That's about it from me. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Rita. Thank you very much for that comprehensive update on uh, uh, what are the efforts being done at the policy level in regards to this ecosystem. Uh, I actually was jotting down about uh, what is the contribution of uh, this ecosystem to our NDC. And I see you put at that as part of your second last slide there. Perhaps we can come back to that later if we have time for Q&A on this. Thank you, Rita. Uh, our next speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Mark Larin. Um, he is the, uh, the, the, the director of uh, Sabah Parks. Uh, he graduated from UKM in 1990 and um, he has joined uh, Sabah Parks in 1992. Uh, and um, since January, 2020, he has been the director of the Sabah Parks. So this is another story of the ecosystem from the other part of Malaysia, very, very important state in regards to this ecosystem. And uh, Dr. McLaren will present something on Tun Mustafa Park, building resilience through marine park, uh, marine protective area. Please, to you, uh, Dr. McLaren. Dr. McLaren, are, are you, I, I saw your slides just now. Uh, I think uh, Dr. McLaren is starting his uh, Zoom. Okay, um, I think there's uh, some technical problem there with Dr. McLaren. Uh, it's, I think Dr. Marina is on, uh, okay. he's on mute, uh, okay. Yep. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hari. I, I apologize my technicalities. I forget no to worries. switch no on my, my microphone. So, Assalamualaikum, good evening, good day to all ladies and gentlemen. My topic for this evening will be to Mustafa Park building resilience through marine protected area. To elaborate this topic, I will use a hodgepodge of uh, issues I have put in a nicely 
uh, set a pyramid set of contents, but the, I think the main issue here, here is the intriguing question of how MPA of Tun Mustafa Park build resilience. So this is related to issues of uh, blue carbon rising, how to revitalize conservation and management of seascape of climate and nature resilience in terms of management of marine protected areas. And I will use Tun Mustafa Park as a case study to introduce to you the TMP or Tun Mustafa Park Integrated, Integrated, Integrated Management Plan 2017 to 2026. So I'm sorry, my slide will be a little bit woody slides rather than colorful. So for, to int introduce the physical aspect of Tun Mustafa Park, the park is situated within the Coral Triangle Marine Area, also known as Amazon of the Sea, the meeting point of two seas or seascapes of uh, biodiversity-rich Sulu Sea, as well as the oil and gas-rich South China Sea, a productive marine ecosystem with large fishing ground. We have recorded uh, richness of biodiversity in the northern tip of Borneo. So the, and for the legislative aspect of Tun Mustafa Park, it is under the Sabah Park's Board of Trustees. Uh, we are a statutory body uh, administering the park's enactment 1984 under the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Environment, Sabah State Government. And we have get since the last over a span of 56 years, we have gazetted nine parks, starting with Kinabalu Park in 1964. And the last park gazetted under the enactment is was uh, Tun Mustafa Park on 19 May 2016. Currently, we have six marine parks and three terrestrial parks. I will focus my talk on the Tun Mustafa Park, the youngest park that we have here in Sabah, also the largest um, marine protected area in Sabah and probably also in Malaysia. The Tun Mustafa Park was gazetted on 2016, cover, covers an area of 898,000 hectares of sea and coastal water with more than 50 islands with Bangi, the largest population of the park is uh, more than 180,000 people and it falls under the IUCN category six multi multiple use park. So the gazettement took quite a long uh, process includes consultation and participation of local communities and management mechanism will be a model for collaborative management that I will introduce uh, today. In terms of socioeconomic demography, approximately 182,332 population uh, of various et ethnicity, namely Ubian, Dusun, Bongi, Kagayan, Suluk, and 70% of uh, people in the island within the park stay in Bangi Island. So some socioeconomic aspects of the people here, including the traditional small-scale fishermen, mostly belong to Group D40, uh, lower income people. Uh, they are also commercial fisheries inside the park area, aquaculture, catch culture, as well as uh, tourism uh, developing uh, in within the park in in the in terms of resort, recreation, and homestay. So we employ a zoning system in the very large area developed over a seven years period prior to the gazettement of the park. We use marine spatial planning methods with four, four main zones identified, namely preservation zone, the, the green scattered dots or blocks inside the map, community use zone, the orange area in the peripheral of islands as well as the coastal area, multiple use zone, the, light blue area and commercial fishing zone, the dark blue in the west side of the park. So the preserve version zone or PZ is a green zone or a no tech zone, which is a fully protection zone in line with the park's enactment 1984, a total of 25 sites identified. Actually this uh, indi individual block of green zone is equal to our existing marine protected areas that we have 
five now outside the Mustafa Park. Uh, therefore, when we calculate these 35 sites actually in Sabah, now we have uh, we have about 50 uh, MPAs. So then in terms of strategic framework, the vision of Tun Mustafa Park is to maintain the integrity of the globally significant marine biodiversity in the TMP and ensure the rich marine resources exist and support the community in a sustainable manner. We'll use uh, three goals, seven guiding principles, and three management approaches, namely managing based on IUCN category six, progressive mainstreaming of collaborative management, promoting local community involvement. So we aim for the seven key result areas of the Tun Mustafa Park, which are fisheries management, marine habitat protection, shoreline management, livelihoods and enterprise management, legal arrangements and, and institutional development, education and awareness, sustainable uh, financing. So this uh, KRA will indicate the stakeholders involved in the parks. So in terms of institutional setup of Tun Mustafa Park, we, from the beginning, we use a collaborative planning we have Tun Mustafa Park Steering Committee, a group of multi-agency multi involvement of uh, agencies from government as well as the NGO. And the, this committee is chaired by our permanent secretary of the Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Environment. There are also several committees, including enforcement uh, on issue-based advisory committee for Tun Mustafa Park. In terms of management structure, we have office in Kudat, Tun Mustafa Park Management Operation Office. Uh, we tackle several programs, issue-based management, database management, institutional training and development, education and awareness. In terms of monitoring and evaluation, we do the management effectiveness assessment tool or MEET uh, for the uh, management of the park. So this is the TMP stakeholders prior to my conclusion. We have identified as uh, several, but non exhaustive list. Uh, these are 25 quick and dirty list of stakeholders and their interest according to the park zoning system. For example, for English Association, they involve, they are uh, interested in multiple use zone as well as commercial fishing zone. And for the, to tourism sector, they will interested in the pres preservation zone, uh, multiple use zone, and multiple use zone too. So this is a, a non-exhaustive list of stakeholders in the Tun Mustafa Park, including also the researcher. There are many researchers interested in doing research here, including a group of blue community from the University of Malaya, as well as other universities, including uh, UMS with uh, doing research in the Tun Mustafa Park. So to conclude, the new approaches that is ongoing initiatives for building nature and climate resilience happening in Tun Mustafa Park will be uh, a new approach. Uh, TMP want to conserve and manage, uh, uh, which is will become uh, our big hope and model for future marine protected areas. Whatever activities we conduct in inside the Tun Mustafa Park will be in tandem with the Sabah Park's vision, uh, which is uh, in 2025, people of Sabah live in harmony with nature. So we aim that Sabah Parks conserves nature for 1,000 years. So with that, I hand over the line to you, Dr. Hari. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. McLaren, for your presentation uh, in regards to the management of uh, ecosystem uh, in, in, in Sabah. Uh, we move to our last presenter before we take the uh, Q&A. Uh, I hope uh, uh, those audience who are listening, uh, you can get ready with some questions if you have. Uh, once we have done with the last speaker, then uh, we can entertain uh, your questions to all our panelists. Now, our last speaker is uh, David McLaren. Um, he's a conservation manager 
uh, for scuba junkies seas uh, uh, on Mabul Island, Sabah, Malaysia. Uh, he's from Ireland and uh, his current work includes raising awareness of marine conservation issues, as well as developing and implementing solutions. Um, uh, he um, He's passionate uh, about the role uh, of the dive industry in marine conservation. That's very good. So perhaps you can speak a little bit about the role of the private sector in, 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 in engaging and protecting this ecosystem. Um, to you, uh, David, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation to participate in today's forum. Um, it is great to join representatives from the Malaysian government, from research institutions and NGOs, all of whom undoubtedly have a major role to play in protecting Malaysia's incredible marine environment and building resilience on our reefs. Now, as you might have guessed, I believe the dive industry is uh, another sector of society that has not only a responsibility to contribute to marine conservation, but also an important role to play. Now, I've had the privilege of living and working on this beautiful little island on the east coast of Sabah, Malaysia, for the past 10 years. And my work has involved spending a fair bit of time below the waves. Um, as well as experiencing some of the most amazing dives of my life, I have also witnessed firsthand the growing threats facing our reefs and the impacts they have. From coral bleaching and storm damage to overfishing and destructive fishing practices, pollution and sadly damage caused by irresponsible tourism. Now we need to alleviate these threats and restore the ecological balance in order to give our reefs a fighting chance against global climate change. In addition to seeing the negatives, I've also thankfully seen the positive impacts that responsible operators can have and how they can help to mitigate against some of the threats facing our reefs. From removing trash on reef and beach cleans to crown of thorn sea star removals during outbreaks and supporting monitoring efforts with organizations like Reef Check Malaysia. Um, in Malaysia, in pre-COVID times, we were blessed with a large and thriving dive industry that covered the length and breadth of the country. And I am confident that post-COVID, once international tourism resumes, that our dive industry will recover and thrive once again. Now, another observation that I have made over the past 10 years is a shift in the dive industry with more and more divers and dive operators becoming environmentally aware um, and embracing sustainability. Back in 2014, the dive operator that I'm affiliated with, Scuba Junkie, um, became a Green Fins member and went straight in as one of the top 10 members globally for their commitment to being environmentally friendly. Now at the time, they were actually the only dive center in Malaysia to feature in that top 10 list. Um, but I'm happy to share that the, the situation has changed and the current standings now show a very different picture um, with actually eight of the top 10 members being Malaysian dive operators. In fact, four of the top five are, which is fantastic. So it is great to know that we have a growing number of operators that are keen to protect the marine environment but we also need to be realistic. Um, sadly, there are still plenty of operators that are causing damage to our reefs on a daily basis. And the challenge for us is to get all operators on board. We need everyone to play their part. Um, first and foremost, by minimizing their environmental footprint, um, followed by giving back through conservation and community initiatives. So some of the actions that we need to see within the dive industry, we need to see all operators embrace, promote and adhere to responsible diving guidelines. So these need to include things like a strict no touch policy, um, all diving equipment should be securely tucked in place, um, boats should not be using anchors, and we should have reduced boat speeds in and around shallow coral reefs and seagrass beds. And these simple actions would help to minimize the risk of damage to our fragile reefs while we enjoy 
our hobby of diving. Um, dive operators should also promote responsible use of sunscreen and reef safe sunscreen options. Uh, Malaysia could even consider a blanket ban on sunscreens that cause coral bleaching. And this is an action that has already been taken in some other countries around the world. Perhaps this is something that could be trialed within marine parks first. As well as their in-water practices, dive operators should also be looking to minimize their carbon footprint and mitigate against other potential adverse impacts presented by their resort or homestay operations. Um, embracing renewable energies and employing sewage treatment are just a couple of examples that spring to mind. Um, resorts should also ensure that all seafood provided in their restaurants is sourced sustainably. In fact, the transition to sustainable seafood goes above and beyond the tourism industry. This is a vital step if we are to replenish fish, fish stocks, restore the ecological balance, and ensure that coastal communities and future generations of Malaysians and international tourists coming here and continue to enjoy sustenance from the ocean. As well as the dive industry doing their own individual part, we also need to be part of a wider stakeholder approach. We've already heard collaborative efforts mentioned and we need more of them. Collaborative efforts will be key to developing and implementing sustainable solutions that protect our reefs. And I'd just like to give a few examples. So I think the dive industry is perfectly placed to act as the eyes and ears for our reefs. I've already mentioned that dive operators are distributed across the length and breadth of the country, and they are in the water on a daily basis, meaning they could be an effective conduit for on the ground information to government, research institutions, and NGOs with regards to things like coral bleaching events and cuts outbreaks. If this information was to reach the government and NGOs quickly, then this would allow for early recognition of impending threats and enable swift action to mitigate against them. In addition to this, in some remote diving locations, there's actually very little in the way of scientific research being done. And I think this is likely due to limited finances and logistical challenges. But again, this is where the dive industry can come in. The dive industry already has accommodation and transport and diving equipment at their disposal. So they could facilitate more scientific research through closer collaboration with local research institutions. As well as this, I think the dive industry is well placed to facilitate outreach programs in collaboration with NGOs and grassroots community organizations and the government raising awareness of the threats facing the local environment and providing opportunities for people to participate in marine conservation will help to build community resilience as well as reef resilience. And I believe, like Julian mentioned, that alternative livelihoods are gonna be vitally important as well. Um, these programs are going to be critical to alleviating some of the threats facing our reefs while also ensuring the coastal communities can continue to provide for their families. Um, on Mandanani Island, um, I know Julian's organization have been pivotal in, in driving a, a coconut oil um, initiative. And this, uh, the slideshow that you can see here is just another example, um, this time from Mabul, where families who used to harvest and sell corals and shells to tourists are now actually creating and selling these beautiful handicrafts. So again, this helps to alleviate pressures on our already threatened reefs. And just a quick final thought from me would just be to encourage further exploration of the concept of co-managed marine areas in Malaysia. I know these have been touched upon by a few of our panelists already, which is fantastic. So if I'm correct, um, we currently have about 7.5% of our marine area designated as protected. And there are plans afoot to expand this network in order to meet international commitments, um, like the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which have already been alluded to. So the target in there, obviously, of 10% of the marine area protected by 2020. 
Um, some have even gone further than that, like the IUCN are suggesting that we need to have 30% protect, protected by 2030. And I think co-managed marine areas would be a way in which um, would be a concept that Malaysia could use um, to help reach those targets. One potential location for a co-managed marine area would be this island that you can see on the slide, um, Pulau Denawan and Pulau Siamil, close to where I am based on the east coast of Sabah. Now, I believe this island has all the raw ingredients necessary to create a co-managed marine area that is financially viable thanks to its incredible marine biodiversity and the major draw card of Twilling Devil Rays, a site that is extremely rare around the world and one that we are very fortunate to, to have here in Sabah in Malaysia um, that is currently not being used by tourism, but is actually being used um, by coastal communities for, for fishing purposes. Um, and so I believe the co-managed marine areas, uh, or sorry, well-designed co-managed marine areas could play a key role in helping us to meet international targets while creating a win-win situation for all involved. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you very much uh, for your passionate um, suggestions on the co-management, as well as your experience there. Uh, where you are based now involving uh, private sector. So um, thank you to all panelists. Uh, at the moment, uh, we are looking for some questions uh, from the audience. Uh, let's see if there are questions uh, posted on the uh, Facebook. Uh, okay, so this is, uh, there, there is a question here, a very general question. What uh, can individuals do uh, to protect uh, malicious marine ecosystem. Okay, so that, that's very relevant to everyone who's listening uh, so that they can relate to what we are discussing now. So anyone wants to go? What can individuals do to protect Malaysia's marine ecosystem? Um, I'll have a go, yeah. Harry. Yeah. Um, I think there's a, the, the obvious thing is when people go to marine, uh, uh, to, to coastal areas, uh, look at the pictures that sh people have shown of people standing on corals, uh, throwing anchors in the water by dive by, by boat and snorkel boat operators and dive boat operators. So you can contribute by going to ethical operators, the sort of people Dave was talking about, the greenfins operators. So just be just be thoughtful yourself. Uh, you can make a huge difference by asking questions, by saying, uh, how is this uh, dive center dealing with its waste? How is it dealing with oil? How is it managing you know, anchor use and so on? Does it use, uh, does it use mooring voice? You don't need to be an expert to, to be able to spot these things. Um, for the townies amongst us, uh, I don't mean that in a derogatory sense, people in the cities don't realize that they do have an impact on coral reefs. Uh, littering, horrible, horrible problem, not just here, it's everywhere. Uh, littering on the street, it ends up in the drains, from the drains it goes to the river, from the river it goes to the islands and the coral reefs. So please stop littering, change waste management habits. And that is a personal decision as much as leaving it to the government uh, you can individuals can make a lot of difference as well. Okay, because of the limited time, I'll go to the next question. Uh, perhaps other panelists have some thoughts about that as well. The first question, but let's go to the second question. Uh, how do you get percentage of the Malaysian tourism money into conservation projects? Uh, should Malaysian implement a small tax that every foreign tourist pay that goes into a Malaysian conservation fund to afford nature based solution? I think this. Some degree of this is happening, I guess, but uh, yeah, uh, maybe uh, anyone wants to talk about it? Uh, Rita or, or, or Julian or Dr. McLaren, uh, anyone about how, um, well, actually I have similar question to that. I wanted to ask about Dave's experience about, um, you know, what is the willingness of people who appreciate this ecosystem? What is the willingness uh, to pay firsthand, you know? There are second and third hand, you know, people do never been there, but they sympathize with this ecosystem and they pay. But what is your experience in terms of imposing this sort of tax? Uh, Dr. Hari, if I may just quickly, quickly yes. take this question. I believe uh, maybe Julian can add on to this. There are uh, currently measures in place for the marine park islands where you have to pay a, a small fee, like a, a conservation fee, which goes back into 
I hope it goes back into the research and conservation in that, you know, in that area. Uh, but the uh, discussion that I've always heard is whether it is too small, it should maybe be increased. Uh, and I believe in uh, most of the discussions thereafter to actually assess how much has been collected and where this goes, that, that mechanism is in place. But there are still questions whether it is adequate because conservation efforts needs uh, financial support. And what we're collecting at the moment, I believe, by the entities involved in managing these areas is a very small portion, very small fraction of what is required. So I'll just start from there and maybe some of those related to marine parks can take it up from there. Sure, the quantum, the issue of the quantum. Yes, I, I'm, I'm sure Dr. McLaren has something to say about this, but just let me add to what Rita, uh, Cheryl said. Yes, there are charges in place. We don't know how much it is, but I would make another plea. Can we please leave some of it on the islands where it's collected Correct. rather than take it all back to centralized government funds? Uh, Dr. McLaren, you're the, you're the expert on this topic. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, Dr. Hari and Cyril. I, I would like to elaborate what Cyril has said. Actually, in, in the context of Sabah parks, because we are a statutory body managing state parks in Sabah, we do collect uh, entrance fee and goes direct into our um, parks fund, meaning that that fund will be fully utilized for the management of the parks. But as Cyril has uh, mentioned just now, the amount is very small. Actually, in our terms, we are subsidized about 50% of the cost of the managing park uh, into the value of the entrance fee tickets or conservation fee. So that is the problem. The, but the bulk of tourism tax goes to the federal fund, not, not the state fund. So or we... We, we don't know how, how to get the, <laughs> to get the fund back into the tourism. Is that of, uh, of, uh, of suggesting or, or imposing a, a higher uh, charges or fee? Is that, is that, is that, I don't know, most of the, well, from what I, I know so far is that there's always a reluctance from the government side to accept these sort of suggestions, even though some are really evidence-based uh, proposals, you know, that, that, you know, the fee can go up to this level and so on. We, we are now thinking about that. And I think in, uh, in some more times in the future, we will do the balancing of the cost and the revenue. So we are on the, I think, on the quite right track now. We are going towards that direction. Thank you, Dr. Harry. Okay, well, I, actually I jotted down another question earlier is that one of the things we need to talk about uh, in regards to these ecosystems, uh, sorry, two things are uh, on the enforcement uh, as well as the funding, you know, that, so I think we've covered up a little bit on the, on the funding side. Of course, there are many issues to talk about about the funding itself, but what about enforcement? Uh, what, 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 is, what is your uh, opinion in regards to uh, you know, we have protected area, we have non-protected area, but even non-protected areas are protected to a certain extent by, I don't know, by the bylaws or policies or whatever, you know. Uh, how, how do we enforce this? Okay, if it is like, for example, to Mustafa, you know, you, you, you know where exactly this space is, you have people to patrol, to control and so on. But generally speaking, how do you enforce the protection of the ecosystem, this ecosystem? Any, any, any thoughts about this? Because, you know, one of the things that, uh, that, that frustrated me earlier on when you talk about biodiversity and terrestrial is that you spend so much of time doing survey, finding the, you know, what is the amount of tigers that we have? And in actual fact, uh, by the second, something is happening at the habitat and at the, at the, at the species level. So, so you have to strike a balance between look, protect first, then you do the survey, or some people say survey first and then you protect, you know, that sort of thing. So generally speaking, what is the enforcement status uh, of what can be done in, in Malaysia in regards to these ecosystems? Anyone? Do you allow me to talk? Yes. <laughs> I will talk on behalf of Tun Mr. Papa. Uh, enforcement is a challenge, a very high cost. Uh, take, for example, uh, Tumkwa Burahman Park nearby Kota Kinabalu City. 
we spend about 200,000 ringgit Malaysia per year to do the civilians survey around the park. But the park is very close, only 15 minutes from the city. So mm. let's imagine Tun Mustafa Park, a very huge sea area, a costly area for what, whatever activities related to patrolling will be, I think, more than maybe up to three to four million ringgit Malaysia per year, if we consider the, the extent of the size. So what, what we are doing in Tunus Tapa Park, we, are, we do a collaborative management. We have a committee, enforcement committee, uh, and we, we do the enforcement together with other security forces like MMEA, Maritime Enforcement Agency, uh, Marine Police, for example, and together do, do the uh, enforcement as well as the ESCOM. Uh, yes. And, and can we? Can I make a plea for a role of with local communities to be involved in, yeah. if not enforcement, then at least patrolling. If you involve local people more, and they understand why they're doing this and why they have a marine park, your compliance improves. Your need for hard enforcement goes down, and you can achieve a lot more with community level uh, yeah. patrolling. This is this is being demonstrated in in, in marine Maybe. parks, MPAs around the world. Uh, involve the local people yes. and get them involved in patrolling and enforcement and, and they, they get more and more buy-in. And we proved this in Tierman. Uh, our, our own example here in Malaysia has shown that the more the local people are involved, the less compliance problems you have, the less enforcement is required. Yeah, we, you, yeah, we do the passive enforcement actually, civilians. Yeah. Yeah. We, that, we, we appointed about 30 uh, honorary park rangers among the communities on the islands. So will be quite effective, but some not very efficient because the participation of that individual park rangers, honorary park rangers is not so encouraging. But we are, from time to time, we will do the a training for them, uh, human development, or how, how to be effective in terms of enforcing the laws as well as the regulations that we are doing now in the terms of Well, but I, I can, have a, sorry, I can add to that, uh, Dr. Hari, and to the discussion. Um, so the basics, yeah, the basic needs or, or the, the, to, to ensure smooth enforcement, there, there are three, three components there, right? First, the law, the regulation. Uh, good. And then secondly, there will be enforcer, right? Enforce, enforce, enforcement agencies or enforce, enforcement officers. That's the second component. And the third component will be the offenders. So these are the three principles or basic um, uh, components to ensure uh, good uh, uh, enforcement or good uh, control of, of uh, protection for, for our natural ecosystems, right? So we, if we get these three components right, if we can identify a potential offender, current offender, yeah, um, uh, the, 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 the sure um, uh, uh, target of offenders, that will be easy, right? So we can zoom in or scope in on that and to strengthen or, or empower uh, enforcer component. And, and of course, from time to time, policies and laws must be revised and, and relook at, right? To, to, because, you know, these... these, these um, Um, technology, th these are dynamic also, right? People will find new ways of, 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 of um, uh, breaking the law. So the lawmaker and the law enforcer also must, must have this mind, must understand the minds of, of offenders, right? So that's the principle. But then more importantly, like Julian uh, pinpoint just now, communities, communities, communities. They, li they have been living there they have been um, enjoying the resources for many generations. They know their place better than any of us, right? So get them involved in restoration, in, in patrolling, in, in being the eyes and ears for the government, for the, for the, for the authorities at first, right? But secondly, because uh, we have been thinking too much of, of charging tourists. Yeah? 
why not local stakeholders also? So if we have, um, because because resources, nature resources actually benefits all of us, not just the two. Surrounding communities, secondary users, um, tertiary users, understand and are aware of, of the benefit uh, they derive from these resources. So they will also have ownership of these resources, right? They, they breathe oxygen from the atmosphere which is produced by all these plants all this nature environment our carbon dioxide uh, being absorbed by i mean uh, blue carbon ecosystems marine ocean marine 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 uh, ecosystems right so we all benefit from this we eat fish yeah i mean people as far as in antarctica in europe eat fish from asia from southeast asia which is protected or, or, or use our natural ecosystem, our coastal our blue carbon ecosystem. So everyone actually in, is involved now. So if we have solid regulatory framework, eh, because we know uh, payments for ecosystem services uh, or, or, or CSR, eh, Corporate Social Responsibility, and we regulate that, try to get involvement by every party. So education, awareness, responsibility, sense of ownership, yeah? and of course, community empowerment. Community-based resource management should also be put. I like, I think this happens in Sabah already, in Malaysia, but yeah, I've, I've um, witnessed this in, in Indonesia, in Philippines, strongly, uh, I mean, provincial, uh, the governors actually pro give some, some authority to the local community to police yeah. their surroundings, right? So there you go, some points. Okay. That, that's the word. I mean, uh, the, see, responsibility comes with mandate. Uh, my very little, you know, very little engagement with the marine community in one of the projects that we did some time ago is that responsibility comes with mandate. I mean, usually uh, they, are, they are very passionate. They want to protect, but they always complain that, you know, that, that, that sort of mandate that, you know, in some places throughout the world, uh, communities are given authority to, to manage and regulate and take care of the area. Anyway, so we have a question. Uh, sorry. That, th yes. This point relates directly to the question that I think you're about to ask, which has come up about uh, what are the actual issues and challenges for the government to Correct. establish collaborative management? Correct. The me, core management. What, uh, what is the problem? I'm on Aldrich's side. I, I think government is not giving enough responsibility to local stakeholders. There you go. Yeah, I think that that's something that Authorities, okay. uh, so we have a question level and at the last maybe, <laughs> yeah, at the at the federal level, you should, should think about it if you want to replicate the, the success story of what's happening in other country. Uh, guys, uh, we are we are almost uh, there. Uh, in fact, we over time actually now. Um, I, I have one last question, perhaps uh, in regards to coming back to the blue carbon. Uh, what is the um, uh, what is happening in regards to this multidisciplinary uh, engagement and support from researchers, policymakers, NGOs, communities, and so on, uh, in regards to understanding the, the, the blue carbon uh, uh, sort of uh, potential that we have uh, in, in our region? Uh, is that happening now? Uh, is that just, just work by the scientists alone? Or is there uh, you know, people from legal, from economics, from business and, 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 and other sectors, statistics and so on that's coming into the picture. What is the latest? Anyone? If I can respond to that, if you remember my second yeah. last or third last slide was the, the um, components or, or some of the stakeholders, key stakeholders in, in research in management and conservation of blue carbon, right? So I realized actually since I, I, I think at least 10 years ago, we realized still um, researchers, for example, are still working in small groups or, or individuals, right? I mean, working at, um, on, on, on each component of, of research uh, related to blue carbon. And there's no um, like coordinating um, um, stronger impact from these research, right? And communities too, they're, they're working, uh, they're, they're doing their things on their own, sometimes without, without referring to, 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 to the authorities or, or governments uh, or, or, or experts too. 
the same goes with uh, government uh, and, and private sectors too. When they want to contribute to conservation, to do conservation work, they don't refer, they didn't refer to, to, to experts and maybe local communities. So this is how, particularly for, for research, and many of you are actually part of this, we, I, I, we've um, uh, proposed uh, the establishment of, of, for example, the Malaysian Mangrove Research Alliance and Network to get everyone to know each other, to get everyone to know what, each, uh, what everyone is doing, particularly on mangrove, and it expands to other connecting habitats like seagrass, coral reefs. So we are all connected somehow. We cannot, we cannot actually be or just focus on one habitats and ecosystems, right? So that, that's one measure. I mean, I mean. It's because this has uh, consequences because if everyone reports different data, authorities will be, will be, will, will have headaches, right? I mean, future, there, there will be no good future references, no good baseline information. Yeah. So this is where we need to get some consensus. So government also authorities should actually open up and listen to wide range of, of academic as well. Because, you know, there are school of thoughts, there are egos as well. Yeah, I know scientists, I know people within this circle, within, because they will push for their ideas. Hypothesis, theories can be discussed, can be brainstormed, eh? can be argued. So this is the beauty of science again. So yeah, there are efforts, but there will be uh, uh, stronger if it comes, uh, if it is agreeable by all stakeholders, all parties. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I, I think uh, I, I think I, I wanted to ask about the question in regards to uh, putting the context of this ecosystem in the nationally determined contribution to NDC that Vita mentioned. I think that's one way of making the government to be more committed, uh, having proper plan, uh, uh, you know, sort of force the government to do something about it on the ground, you know, so that you, you can report uh, about it uh, later uh, uh, as part of your commitment. Uh, so that would be the last. Uh, Rita, anything you want to say about that? Because I, I, I noticed that in your second last slide, you, you mentioned that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hari. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Hari. Uh, yeah, I'll just briefly mention, I think I, I, I totally uh, agree with what the, Dr. Adri has mentioned earlier. And coming from the opposite side, I don't come from the, I have a science background, but I come from the policy side now. We believe that whenever we try to come up with, you know, policy recommendations and so on, the question that often popped out is, do we have enough data? Is there enough uh, baseline information that the universities can share with us? Because that would then support the policies that we want to recommend and so on. So I think that was the same discussion when it came to NDCs. Uh, believe me that there is drive in, within the government that says that, yes, blue carbon is a good thing. We have to incorporate it into our so-called policies, uh, climate change, uh, mitigation, adaptation, and so on. But the understanding at the moment is we don't have enough baseline. I, I believe there are studies being done by uh, specific universities, but you have to come forward and share that with the related uh, focal government agencies or ministries, where this will then be taken up, uh, like Dr. Hari, you've rightly mentioned, into you know a more concrete uh, incorporation into national strategies, policies, you know, uh, framework, institutions, and so on. So I believe there is a you know you have to look at it from both ways where the government people are saying we don't have enough data yet and the scientists are actually working on it and you know you have to put that back into the government effort so it, it has to come from both sides uh, but uh, from what I've understood uh, there has been a huge drive especially when we started uh, discussing blue carbon under Coral Triangle initiative but unfortunately due to COVID it slowed down a little bit uh, meetings with its CTI itself has slowed down a little bit but there was the push factor actually came from that platform. But at the same time, there's a lot more happening and we hope in 2021, we will better connect these dots and bring these different uh, people together and you know work on, on this subject matter. I hope that answers uh, your, your question, Dr. Hari. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Rita. Thank you very much. So uh, we have uh, finished the Q&A session. Time's up. Thank you very much uh, uh, for people who asked the question in the FB. Interface. Uh, Dr. Hari, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but interface in between what Cheryl mentioned and what I mentioned earlier, interface, com scientific communication needs this bridging. 
people like Cheryl, background of science, now doing policy, is the best person to communicate or re-communicate scientific findings into policy. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you uh, all panelists. Thank you very much for your time, your effort. Uh, your presentation has been very useful to the audience. Uh, and I hope that um, in future, there will be more uh, vigorous discussion to protect this ecosystem, uh, not only for the blue carbon, but we also mentioned about the other ecosystem services that uh, these systems provide. So thank you very much. Uh, to everyone else, um, uh, we're gonna have a, a, a video now. So with that, uh, we will end our session uh, for this uh, afternoon. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. We call it Earth, and yet nine-tenths of the space for life lies in the ocean. This great expanse provides half the oxygen we breathe, it regulates the planet's climate, and feeds billions of people. Without a healthy ocean, there would be no life as we know it. However, Human activities and climate change have put it under pressure. The ocean has taken care of us for generations, but we need to take much better care of it into the future. From mangroves to coral reefs, from the polar regions to the open ocean, we must create marine protected areas. These special places safeguard biodiversity and sustain ecosystems. They help absorb carbon and provide livelihoods for millions of coastal communities. But above all, they give us hope for the future. In 2010, world leaders agreed to protect one-tenth of the ocean. We now know that this is not enough. To give the ocean and humanity a chance, we must look after the whole ocean. And we need to reach at least 30% protection within the next decade. Now is the time for action to come together and to scale up effective protection for the future of us all. favorite singer. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching this uh, session uh, where he discussed a lot about blue carbon rising. And we do learn a whole lot more about how to revitalize uh, conservation and management of coastal wetlands and also seascapes for climate and natural resources. Um, I would like to uh, thank all the panelists, Dr. A. Aldri Amir, Dr. McLaren Lakim, Cheryl Rita Kaur, Julian Hyde, Dr. Amy Tan, and also Dave McCann. But last but not least, of course, the moderate, moderator itself, Dr. Hari Ramalu. Um, here with, um, before we end this session, I'd just like to remind everyone that our next session at 4 p.m., we do have um, a session uh, brought to you by BCSD Malaysia and also event partner by WBCSD. And um, the, the title is called The Business Case for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. All right. 
So um, thank you very much one more time. Uh, before we leave the session, uh, how about wave to all, uh, everyone who have actually watched us. And um, please hold on uh, for a short webby um, group selfie. Thank you.